Hello, I'm Dr. Erica Rose Jeffrey, and I'm so pleased to be able to join you for this year's Ballet Beyond Borders. I'm going to be sharing a little bit about my work connecting dance and peace building, looking at both the practice and research in the field. Before I go any further, though, it's important that I acknowledge the traditional owners of the lands that we are all gathering from today. I live and work on Yagara and Turrbal lands in Brisbane, Australia, and I want to pay my deep respects to elders past, present, and emerging, and acknowledge the important role that arts and culture have played in communities around the world for thousands of years, connecting, providing opportunities for creativity, and building relationships. I'm so pleased to be able to share some of my work uh, from the recent book that I have published with my colleague, Dr. Leslie Pruitt, called Dancing Through the Distance, Creative Movement and Peace Building. I'm going to talk a little bit about what we found through our research, but also contemporary connections around dance and politics, social change, and what's happening in the now. First of all, I'm a lifelong dancer and I'm so thankful for the many opportunities that I've had to learn new dances, meet wonderful people, and to continue to explore my curiosity around the arts. I also am a bit of a dance activist and believe that we all can have more dance in our lives. Our new book explores the relationship between peacebuilding and dance, including insights dance provides on key debates around peace and conflict. We suggest that dance, as an aesthetic embodied medium, can support peacebuilding in its capacity to embrace emotions, support relationships across difference, and supplement and sustain other types of dialogue. In our book, we explore the process of how this takes place, and in doing so, we illuminate prospects and challenges in the broader practice and study of peacebuilding. I will highlight elements of our research, including youth leadership and empathy, as well as discuss links regarding dance, politics, and diplomacy. First, I'd like to highlight how timely questions of dance and peacebuilding are with some recent examples of the way dance is implicated in politics and peacebuilding. At the end of October, dancing became politicized when the video of Vice President-elect Kamala Harris dancing in the rain at a campaign event became a meme for both her supporters and detractors. Viewed by over 2 million people, the same images prompted very different responses. For some, it was praise for sending a message of power and joy, while for others it was criticism for dancing while campaigning and that she was not taking the job seriously. Given the previous attention regarding female politicians in dancing, such as Jacinda Ardern, Theresa May, and Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, I think that it's likely we will see more stories about dance and female politicians in the future. Young people have been increasingly visible in their use of dance connected to social change. Pending the removal of the Robert E. Lee statue in Richmond, Virginia, a photo of Ava Holloway and Kennedy George, two 14-year-old dancers, became an iconic image of young people's voices for social change. As Kennedy said in an interview, you can protest in many different ways. We are powerful. In June, 16-year-old Shayla Avery started to organize protests, intentionally including dance and performances with her fellow dancers from Destiny Arts in Oakland, California, as seen in this photo. Their experiences in the context of COVID-19, as well as organizing and performing at protests are documented in a film, The Black Hole. In Australia, Canberra Dance Theatre's Gold Company, for dancers over 55, performed Carol Brown's and Kathy Combs' work, Imperium, about the use and abuse of power outside the Australian Capital Territory Assembly Building in conjunction with the passing of legislation on the prevention of elder abuse. These are just a few of the many different ways in which people are currently talking about and using dance in political perspectives. Dance can help us understand social and political change, both through the embodied act of dancing constituting a political expression and through the ways dance functions as a metaphor for political dialogue.
<clears throat> Around the world, people seeking to address social injustice and build peace in a variety of contexts have increasingly recognized the value of dance for peace building. Yet standard approaches from the United Nations or other formal organizations engaged in peace building tend to render dance, along with other everyday politics and everyday life practices, invisible, thereby dismissing arts and dance-based approaches as soft or not serious. Our research builds on existing scholarship considering creative approaches to peace building. We see the sidelining of dance as linked to international relations lack of imagination when it comes to theorizing bodies and their global political significance. There's a frequent division in international relations between mind and body that slights the political significance of bodies themselves. In contrast, we see bodies as constructed politically, socially, and culturally, and thus both produced and productive. Bodies are targets of violence, but they are malleable, so they can also resist and produce different political possibilities and identities, and in the process generate new social configurations. While most attention in international relations on embodiment has focused on its role in understanding violence, our work deeply interrogates embodiment in relation to peace. Our research explores how reflecting on embodiment might offer new insights into peace building and how dance can inform our understanding of the everyday practice of peace. It explores how peace building through dance profoundly builds relationships across stark differences, navigates local and global aspects of peace building through a terrain of common ground and addresses challenges in everyday conflict resolution and peace building practice. In our work, one of the things that we've considered is a typology regarding dance and peace building. So we've looked at some initial categories in terms of where dance and peace building might fit in. Now these are fluid and practices might exist in more than one and overlap and move between different uh, categories, but it's a helpful way to start to think about this kind of work. These include uh, therapeutic, artist-led social change or protest, community-led social change or protest, collective forms of dance, educational and diplomatic. So these can be seen in many different ways in which dance is activated in peace and conflict work. Research for our book involved case studies with programs using dance to involve young people in peace building across three countries, Colombia, the Philippines, and the United States. Each of these sites featured different contexts of violence and varied approaches to peace. Looking across the sites allows us to consider nuance and context as well as commonalities across the locales. The same global NGO ran the program in cross sites. Research for the book included document analysis, semi-structured interviews, and participant observation at workshops and trainings. A series of workshops incorporated dance to involve young people in peace building, facilitated by young peer leaders held in schools, universities, and community centers. They started with a warm-up, then moved to task-based dance activities, including discussion of a peace building skill, such as expressing emotions, and then closed following a relaxation exercise. The overall aim was to discover and value difference, promote empathy, support leadership development, and work collaboratively to build peace. We conducted our research with an NGO started by a young woman who designed the original program, and almost all the facilitators, curriculum developers, and participants were young people. By listening to these young peace builders' ideas, we learned about how they got involved in building cultures of peace locally, nationally, regionally, and globally. Even though youth are often sidelined in formal peace building processes, in this research we've documented some of the many important roles young people can have and do to take on as leaders for peace. And we've looked at how that leadership has been facilitated by dance in many contexts. As one participant from Colombia explained, I think that being part of the Dance and Peace program reinforced my leadership ability. Dancing helped me get out into the world, so I think the program reinforced my leadership skills through the strategies it used. 
Another young woman said, I mean, personally, dance for me taught me a whole lot, and I learned so much just about leadership and about myself and about working with other people. These young peace builders made these important connections between their experience of dance, leadership, and peace. In moving to the next section, we also explore the concept of empathy, including prospects and challenges it poses in arts-based peace building. To do so, we analyzed a set of creative dance activities involving the use of mirroring. Mirroring is a well-established dance activity that is used in many settings and contexts, including some of the mainstream peace building resources, which include it as an icebreaker. As seen in our three case studies, mirroring can invite interpersonal exchange and support the development of empathy. This empathy can promote understanding across difference and likewise contribute to peace building, including the restructuring of relationships after violence. In short, we suggest that one, nonviolent ways of expressing emotion are crucial for peace building. Two, empathy is a key emotion to address in the aim of peace building. And three, dance activities, including mirroring, when used with critical reflection, can offer a promising way to foster empathy development and thus support peace building. In the next couple of images, I'd like to share some of the young people's uh, thoughts in their own words about how they explained their experiences. It's just like the whole concept is kind of for the empathy. It's like movement-based learning. You, I can identify my emotions better when they're expressed through movement than when they're just cold to me, from Claire. Or from Valeria from Colombia. I think the biggest skill that I've acquired is empathy. It's putting myself in the place of others. Now I think I can handle my conflicts a little better because now I think of others instead of only thinking of myself. Or from Aubrey, I learned a lot of new things. How dance exchange is proof of the fact that we all define dance differently. What can be symbolic movement to one person is different in each context. It's always important to look at risks and limitations and questions that might arise from a particular arts-based peace building program. In our research, short timelines or project-based funding um, was a difficulty in terms of looking at a lack of long-term sustainable funding. Related to this was a focus on measurable outcomes, which can be more challenging in an arts-based approach. There are also ongoing questions about access and inclusion and how to improve in different contexts. In some cases, there was a focus on growth that may have not made sense in a particular local context. Across different countries, young people emphasize the importance of considering their voices and their own local context. I'm going to shift gears now, moving away from our specific research on dance and peace building to look at the broader picture of dance and diplomacy. I'm going to start with a couple of examples from the United States. So from the 1950s to the 1970s, there were a large number of U.S. dance companies that traveled on international tours with U.S. State Department support. This program was revived in a new form as Dance Motion USA and ran from 2010 to 2019 as a cross-cultural exchange partnership between the Brooklyn Academy of Music and the U.S. State Department. When considering dance and diplomacy, I think it's important to look at the many different facets of how dance is activated. And this quote from Warburton speaks to that, saying that dance for diplomacy can operate as a form of political protest or a kind of etiquette. It can be exported or exchanged. It can be a colonizing force or a vehicle for dialogue and understanding. It can be many of these things simultaneously. I think it's important when we're looking at cultural diplomacy to consider these multiple perspectives, including all of the people who are impacted, different countries, communities, artists, and audiences, both formal and informal, and to consider that uh, the intent and how it can be received in terms of performances also have multiple perspectives as well. In Australia, companies such as Bangara Dance Theatre explore indigenous stories in contemporary forms, 
performing across Australia and internationally, engaging in cultural diplomacy on multiple levels of community. As director Stephen Page says, traditional culture told through stories through the myriad of mediums is a great way to imprint a true identity about who we are as Australia. This idea of engaging on multiple levels is also important in terms of how we are telling our stories, how we're expressing and voices are being heard. In terms of contemporary issues, in addition to the use of dance and protests, such as the Black Lives Matter movement, many artists and companies are exploring issues of climate change through their work, such as Carol Armitage's On the Nature of Things or Australian Dance Theatre's North-South. When we're thinking about the idea of dance, politics, social change, and building peace, I just wanted to touch on this important issue of how artists are using dance as a medium to express their voices about the role of climate change in our communities. Linking back to our research on dance, young people, and peace building, Overall, the youth peace builders we spoke to highlighted the need to reflect on complexities, including the challenges and opportunities that may arise when we attempt to connect, translate, and look inward as well as outward within and between cultures in pursuing peace. Like a complex piece of choreography, there's an ongoing process of learning, revising, improvising, and practicing. That idea that we need to practice peace is also important, bringing with it a sense of curiosity, creativity, and embodiment. Thank you very much for your time and attention, and I look forward to a rich discussion.